TPN Fundamentals, Part 1, The Basics. Hi everyone, and welcome to this segment of the PharmEasy Tutor. Feeding a patient through their veins using TPN, or total parental nutrition, has been used for over 60 years to keep malnourished, critically ill patients alive. Because of the nature of its complexity, TPN has been managed only by specialists knowledgeable in the field of nutrition. Over the years, pharmacists have participated and have played a major role in the management of TPN, tailoring specific formulas for each individual and closely monitoring and making necessary changes to the formula on a daily basis. This four-part lecture series will serve as a tutorial on TPN fundamentals. We will go over some background information on nutrition, then present step-by-step -step methods of how to create a patient-specific formula. We'll also discuss how we modify TPN formulas for specific diseases, such as renal failure and diabetes. And finally, we will cover some controversies surrounding nutrition and some TPN monitoring concepts. So let's begin with some TPN history in part one of TPN Fundamentals. The developer of Total Parental Nutrition was a surgeon named Dr. Stanley Dudrick. In the late 1960s, Dr. Dudrick noticed that even though operations on his patients were technically successful, many patients still died. He discovered that many of the deaths were caused by severe malnutrition. Dr. Dudrick developed a pioneering breakthrough treatment called Total Parenteral Nutrition, or TPN, which bypasses the intestinal tract when a patient cannot receive food or fluids by mouth and instead injects nutrients, liquid carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and electrolytes directly into the circulatory system through a vein near the heart. He initially used the TPN technique to feed beagle puppies entirely through the central vein. Using six beagle puppies and an intravenous concentrated nutrient solution, he showed that the dogs would grow and develop normally until adulthood, resulting in six grown dogs, including one puppy named Stinky, that were comparable in size to those fed normally. Here are photos of the growth of the beagle puppies after 235 days. There appears to be no difference whether the dog was fed orally or by IV route. In 1967, he used the intravenous method on a three and a half pound newborn girl with a fatal small bowel deformity. By providing TPN, the child's growth and development proceeded for a year as if normal gastrointestinal function was present. Dr. Dudrick's first adult emergency case was a 52-year-old 5-foot 2-inch woman who had dropped to 49 pounds after stomach surgery. With TPN, in two months she was up to 79 pounds and a month later she was sent home eating normally and weighing 100 pounds. Other developments resulted from these initial efforts. The Dudrick team demonstrated the technique of safe, long-term central venous catheterization, use of essential amino acids in renal failure, and using TPN to close small bowel fistulas. Malnutrition is commonly seen in patients before and during hospitalization. The incidence of malnutrition worsens over time in patients who require prolonged hospitalization. Malnutrition can be due to a number of factors including a history of decreased spontaneous food intake before hospital admission, anorexia, gastrointestinal symptoms, depression and anxiety, and other medical and surgical factors. An association exists between moderate or severe malnutrition and a range of significant negative clinical outcomes. Malnutrition is associated with longer length of hospital stay increased infectious complications, impaired wound healing, poor survival, and increased cost of care. Providing adequate nutritional intake will provide exogenous fuels to preserve lean body mass, optimize cell and organ function and wound repair, attenuate the catabolic and inflammatory response, and will reduce complications. The majority of statements in this lecture are based on guidelines and recommendations made by the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, ASPEN, a nationally known and respected organization. ASPEN is a nonprofit professional organization 
composed of multidisciplinary healthcare professionals. The mission of Aspen is to improve patient care by advancing the science and practice of clinical nutrition and metabolism. Enteral nutrition is the provision of nutrients via the alimentary tract by oral intake or through enteric feeding tubes such as nasal gastric, nasal jejunal, gastric, or jejunostomy. In the diagram, you can see the feeding tube that passes through the nose, throat, and esophagus and continues through the stomach, ending in the first section of the small intestine. It is controlled by an electric pump. If the gut works, use it. In patients who have a functional gastrointestinal tract and who are able to receive adequate enteral nutrition, use the gut. Clinical practice guidelines and extensive data uniformly support the use of enteral nutrition via the gut as the preferred route of nutrition delivery over intravenous parenteral nutrition. In the majority of critically ill patients, enteral nutrition is the first choice of nutrition support because it is more practical and safer to use than parenteral nutrition. The beneficial effects of enteral nutrition compared to parenteral nutrition are well documented in the literature. Enteral nutrition provides more physiologically sound nutrients, better maintains intestinal mucosal structure and gut absorptive and barrier functions, results in a significant reduction of infectious complications, pneumonia and central line infections, is associated with fewer mechanical and metabolic complications, and is less expensive. The human microbiome is the rich microbiota that populates the entire GI tract. It consists of greater than 10 to the 14th microorganisms. The gut microbiome influences the immune system through its effect on systemic metabolism. Lack of enteral nutrition or by using parenteral nutrition will abruptly deprive the intestinal microbiome of nutrients and significantly disrupt the normal GI flora of the microbiome which will cause mucosal atrophy, impaired immunity, which will then result in endotoxin absorption, ball wall inflammation, and eventually a pro-inflammatory state of the GI tract. Providing enteral nutrition to the gut not only delivers macronutrients, but it also maintains the gut's structural integrity, reduces inflammation and bacterial virulence, modulates the systemic immune response, and assists with stress ulcer prophylaxis. Enteral nutrition preserves the gut barrier integrity by maintaining tight junctions between the epithelial cells, stimulating blood flow, reducing colonic bacterial overgrowth, and diminishing endotoxin and bacterial translocation. Here's a diagram of a healthy gut with tight junctions between the epithelial cells. When these epithelial cells become damaged, there is faulty tight junctions, which allows bacteria and toxins to translocate into the bloodstream and cause inflammation to occur. How soon should enteral feedings be started? When possible, early nutritional support therapy via the enteral route should be initiated within 24 to 48 hours in a critically ill patient. I've enlisted the services of our resident nutrition experts, chefs Andre and Pierre, to help us out through this journey to describe and explain TPN. So they'll be with us, assisting throughout this lecture series. When delivery of nutrition via the enteral route is not possible, Parenteral nutrition may be considered to provide adequate calories and protein to the patient to achieve anabolism. Parenteral nutrition should be started when enteral nutrition is contraindicated, usually in approximately 10 to 15% of patients. TPN is defined as the provision of complete intravenous feeding, including fluids, dextrose, amino acids, lipids, and micronutrients, which include electrolytes, vitamins, and minerals, in situations where oral or enteral nutrition is not feasible. The use of TPN therapy should be scrutinized and should only be used in patients who will demonstrate benefit. 
The judicious selection of candidates to be fed parenterally is essential to adhere to evidence-based usage that form the foundation of appropriate TPN therapy. Here are some key indications for TPN that are approved by Aspen. The persistence of any one of these conditions for more than three to seven days should justify TPN use. When should TPN be started? Well, it all depends on the patient's nutritional status. For patients who have been unable to receive significant nutrients via oral or enteral route, in a well-nourished, stable adult, we can initiate parenteral nutrition after seven days. For those that are nutritionally at risk, we can initiate parenteral nutrition within three to five days. And in patients with baseline moderate or severe malnutrition, we should initiate TPN as soon as is feasible. Let's talk about energy and protein requirements. We need to calculate how many calories and how much protein a patient needs per day. How do we do this? The gold standard for determining energy requirements in the critically ill patient is called indirect calorimetry. When indirect calorimetry is available, energy requirements can be individually estimated on a daily basis for measurements of oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. However, this method is often cumbersome, technically difficult, or impossible to perform in critically ill patients. You can see in the figure that indirect calorimetry requires the patient to don a spacesuit type device to measure gases. This is impractical to use in critically ill patients. What about using predictive equations such as Harris-Benedict? More than 200 predictive equations have been published in the literature with accuracy rates ranging from 40% to 75% when compared with indirect calorimetry. No single equation emerges as being more accurate. Predictive equations are less accurate in obese and underweight patients. Therefore, based on expert consensus, current recommendations for energy requirements for critically ill patients are 25 to 30 kcals per kilo per day of actual body weight. What about energy requirements for obese patients? Energy and protein requirements for obese patients are calculated differently. These are patients with a BMI greater than 30. This will be covered in part three of this lecture series. What about protein needs? Sufficient protein in higher doses should be provided. Protein requirements are expected to be in the range of 1.2 to two gram per kilogram of actual body weight per day. Recent studies in critical illness suggest that provision of protein is more closely linked to positive outcomes than provision of total energy. TPN is most often administered via a central venous catheter or central TPN, and less often through a peripheral vein or peripheral TPN. Central venous access can be obtained via the subclavian or internal jugular veins. Central catheters allow the delivery of concentrated nutrients contained in hyperosmolar solutions. The high blood flow in these large vessels rapidly dilutes the concentrated formula. Indwelling central catheters can be placed for patients that are suitable for long-term TPN. They're called Broviac, Hickman, or Groshong. PIC lines or peripherally inserted central catheter lines are inserted in the arm and are guided to the superior vena cava. PIC lines are associated with an increased risk for deep vein thrombosis, limiting use for indefinite TPN therapy. Peripheral TPN can be used when central access is not possible or cannot be placed. Peripheral lines are more easily accessed, but there are major disadvantages to its use. Here are some disadvantages of using peripheral TPNs. Peripheral veins cannot tolerate the highly concentrated nutrient admixture solutions. Therefore, peripheral TPN admixtures are limited by their osmolarity. Peripheral TPNs must maintain an osmolarity of less than 900 milliosmoles per liter. Higher osmolarity is associated with thrombophlebitis. The maximum dextrose concentration in a peripheral TPN should be limited to 8%. 
Peripheral IVs are intended for short-term use, and the need for frequent line reinsertion is a limitation. And because peripheral TPN cannot be highly concentrated, a high volume or infusion rate is often required to meet nutritional needs. In terms of volume, a rough volume of 30 ml per kilogram of body weight as the total daily volume from all sources can be used as an approximate amount of fluid to give to a patient. However, when determining an appropriate rate for a patient, any fluid restrictions or disease states that may affect fluid intake must be taken into consideration. In summary, we talked about the history of TPN and the impact of malnutrition, using enteral feedings first if the gut works, the importance of maintaining a stable microbiome, appropriate indications for TPN and the different routes of administration, and how to calculate a patient's energy and protein requirements. Next up, discuss the ingredients of TPN, the macro and micronutrients, and go over an example of starting a patient on TPN. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.